Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind God Conversation podcast, a place to learn about groundbreaking ideas from thought leaders in the area of health, food, the science of mind body interactions, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to speak to Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez, a world renowned microbiome expert who has studied the pre and postnatal influences on the developing gut microbiome and the implications of this early development for health and disease. I'm particularly excited about this conversation with Gloria today as we share an interest in the Yanomami indigenous people of the Orinoco and Amazon regions in South America that both of us had the privilege to visit. Dr. Dominguez is the Henry Rutgers Professor of Microbiome and Health at Rutgers University. She's affiliated with the Departments of Biochemistry and Microbiology and of Anthropology, and is the Director of the Institute for Food, Nutrition, and Health. She's a Fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Her work centers on impacts exerted on the microbiome by urban practices, including practices that impair early life microbiota transmission and colonization, such as C-sections, and studying changes on microbiomes across urbanization gradients. Gloria has published some 70 scientific manuscripts on symbiosis, impacts of modern practices on the microbiome, and strategies for restoration. She also is a co-founder of the Microbiota Vault, a global initiative to preserve the diversity of the microbes relevant to human health. Together with her husband, Martin Blazer, she stars in the new award-winning documentary, The Invisible Extinction, which is streaming on Amazon. Welcome to the show, Gloria. Yeah, Gloria, it's it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you again. Uh, I I wanted to start out um, with this conversation with the way that we met each other at a NIH conference. I don't know, it was 10 or 15 years ago, <clears throat> where you gave a talk about the Yanomami and their microbiome. And when I saw these, your your PowerPoint presentations, I couldn't believe it because, as you know, I had been there as a student um, on a documentary film ex uh, exhibition and I think this was like even, you know, like 10 years bef before you did your studies. And it, it was one of the most amazing experiences for me at the time just to, you know, live with these people for for, for a month in their Shabona. And so that's just as an introduction. So that's how we had a synchronicity that sort of linked us uh, t together through the microbiome. Um, so thank you for inviting me, Emran. It's a big pleasure to be here. Yeah, and for me, it's exciting. Um, you know, I've been reminded um, of the the exciting work um, that that you and and your husband have been doing by your recent uh, documentary films. I want to say this now, and going to say it at the end again that I would encourage anybody who is interested in the microbiome and our health and diseases to to watch this film on 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 amazon the invisible extinction i think you said the silent the silent the invisible extinction <laughs> right sorry sorry um anyway so i i want to touch upon two topics that you have done similar res uh, seminal research and um which has had a major impact on on our conceptualization of the microbiome and particularly its development from early on in life, so one is 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 clearly the um, what what happens prenatally and postnatally with the infant microbiome, and what are the the dangers and the opportunities that that this this window uh, gives us as as you know, healthcare providers. And then I also want to come back to you again to ask you some some questions about. You, your studies in the microbiome of uh, indigenous people on 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 the uh, Orinoco River, and what implications that has for our current understanding. So, let's let's start with uh, you know maternal infant transmission of the of of the microbiome. So first of all, um, 
this has received quite a bit of attention with the increased number of C-sections that are happening around the world. In some countries, the majority of, of infants come in, into this world by a C-section. What what is the if if you could just say what is the general problem with that? So C sections and why is a natural vaginal birth so important? So we happen to be mammals. We are the only species of hominids that evolve um, that are, have survived uh, to to the day. Uh, we had other species, a couple of species in the Homo genus, and uh, they disappeared, uh, probably because Homo sapiens has killed them. But every uh, non-human primate, uh, every human primate, every non-human primate, and every mammal, and every vertebrate have evolved a canal to have babies, to lay the eggs or to have the live uh, baby being born. And in every case, this canal is covered by important bacteria for babies, for newborn babies. So these bacteria are bacteria that increase the fitness of the babies that are good for the babies. And in the case of mammals, mammals are the only animals that their newborns will not eat a diet from outside, but will eat a secretion of their mothers, which we call breast milk. So those bacteria are boosted by breast milk. Breast milk, in addition to feeding the baby, feed the good bacteria. So babies, when they cross the birth canal, they come from a sterile environment. The uterus is sterile. Um, the immune system is in charge to keep sterile the environments that are threatened by bacterial colonization. There are forbidden territories. That doesn't mean that fetuses are not exposed to the metabol metabolites that are generated by the maternal microbiome. They are. Anything circulating in the, bo in the body of the mother reaches the fetus, but not microorganisms that are alive. So at least bacteria. Yeah, so if I may uh, want to say something, I, I find that fascinating and, and, and really kind of partially ignored in research that it's the maternal microbiome before birth that exerts a major influence on, on the development of the fetus through the, meta through the microbial generated uh, metabolism. Right. Exactly. And there, there is some recent, very recent work on that. And that, that's the way to go. We need to understand how does the maternal microbiome is exerting effects and modulating the baby, the fetus? So by the time labor starts, as soon as the mother breaks waters, bacteria can ascend. And unfortunately for women, labor is not four seconds, right? It's in a good scenario, two hours of exposure. In a normal scenario, is 10 hours, and in a less lucky scenario, it's 18 hours before a C-section is done. So it's a lot of hours, a lot of um, duplication or growth of bacterial populations that have colonized every body site of the baby. The baby is rubbing against the walls of the canal, swallowing, etc. By the time the baby's out, the baby is heavily colonized with, with mom's microbes. And then the secondary exposure, exposure is the air, and then the skin of the mother, and then the mouth of the mother, and there are successive exposures that continue uh, colonizing the babies. But babies are not born sterile, except if you take them out from the sterile sac in, you know, very quickly into the air of the operating room. The air of the operating room is filled with micro flakes of skin because it's the only source of bacteria in an operating room is human, mostly skin, also oral. We have studied that also. It's an environment that never sees soil because there is a cleaning team that are shedding bacteria from their skin. There are nurses, doctors that have exposed skin, part of the face is exposed, part of the arms. 
the spider of them using masks. So they are shedding uh, flakes of skin and a lot of skin bacteria. And th those are the bacteria that first colonize newborns born by C-section. So what is the effect of being born sterile without being exposed and having been colonized with a normal mammalian maternal bacteria? That's something that I study. So this is a situation that is totally new in evolution. I mean, for, for hundreds of thousands of years, it's gone through the vaginal de uh, delivery mode. And all of a sudden, we've changed this dramatically. Um, it's a little like antibiotics. You know, these are, C-section is miraculous. It saves lives when it's needed. And then the question is, so, so suppose we didn't abuse antibiotics. We didn't abuse C-section, which we do. I mean, is that in many countries is becoming, is becoming the choice of giving birth mm -hmm. without medical indication. Uh, suppose that we only use it, we improve labor, which is something that needs to happen to ask women to go through labor. You know, we need to establish a support system that helps them run the marathon, the most natural naturally uh, possible. Um, but still C-sections are needed in about one, 1 1.5 cases per 10. So it's 10 to 15% of the cases. If you don't do C-section, the baby uh, is compromised or the mother is compromised. And we see that in the Amazon. It's a very high baby mortality or maternal mortality. So thanks God we have medicine. The question is, can we restore? Because we won't give up using medicine. We won't give up using antibiotics. How can we restore after the needed intervention? That's a big question. So, uh, I mean, the question before that is, you know, you would expect such a, such a fundamental process that's been around and has evolved, you know, with evolution. Normally evolution perfects this like processes and keeps them you know over a long period of time if they're if, if they're useful what is the consequence of of of, of the c-section to bypassing this natural system right are, are there uh, major yeah so we are kind of uh, we are still we we are still too new as a species and we haven't fully optimized our so we have when we have gone through a a compromise between standing in two legs. We, we, we are the only mammals that are bipedal. Bears can go for a little while, but they really walk on four legs. Monkeys, everybody walks on every quadruped. We are the only bipedal individuals, species in the planet. And that came with a big cost because our pelvis narrowed to be able to optimize locomotion, walking, because we became hunters. And, and that's how we think we needed to socialize and develop a language, et cetera, free the hands to use tools. The, the cost is having babies. We are, nobody in nature has the problems natural. Uh, uh, another thing is, um, you know, dogs that have been selected for big heads that need to be born by C-section. But no, but no, no one else naturally has such a trouble giving birth. So what made us humans made us also very difficult labor, you know, mm. keepers. So, you know, if we don't have C-sections, babies die or mothers die. But the point is, so we need C-sections, mm -hmm. but we don't, need probably as many as they are uh, used. So we are, medicine is allowing natural selection to stop acting. And we want to save everybody, which is okay. I mean, I'm very happy that mm -hmm. we can save individuals that would have died otherwise. But the point is we are still product, whether we like it or not, we are product of evolution. And we need to understand how are we wired? Why are we designed the way we are? What are the limitations? And especially, what do we need to be healthy? 
if you screw the whole system during you know education of during development that window of the, the development is crucial if you intervene there you, you are probably misleading the trajectory of development of many systems so we need to if we need to intervene we need to restore to keep the normal development developing happening and that's where we are very very new at doing we have to explore and, and this is a thought that normally comes from ecology not from medicine medicine is very focused not even on prevention medicine is about diseases and how you cure diseases uh, public health is a it's a minor component in the in the minds of of medicine still uh, they have grown substantially, but restoring is even farther back. It's very difficult to get funding because the you know the people that evaluate the proposals are mostly medically oriented. They don't ask health questions; they ask disease questions. So I mean, uh, you know, coming back to this, uh, you know, I mean, I can't wait till you you know you tell me about these interventions and what we can do, but let's, let's spend a couple of minutes on, I mean, what, what are, so uh, not doing a C-section in, in difficult deliveries, obviously, you know, would lead to death of the, of, of the infant or, you know, anoxic damage to the brain, but what's the collateral damage from the C-section? Uh, what, what, what diseases, are there any diseases that are more common in, in babies born by C-section? Has is, is that firmly been established? Absolutely. So there is an epidemiological association in human studies and also causal association in animal studies. If a baby is born with the wrong and acquires the wrong set of microbes, the trajectory of microbiome maturation is altered and that alters the education of the immune system. So as with antibiotics in early life, being born sterile into the air of an operating room is associated with higher risks of immune and metabolic diseases. And it's not surprising, again, because you are causing the impact during the window of development. So if the maturation trajectory deviates, then development of the immune system, metabolic system is also also altered. So this means that designing interventions at this early, since 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 you can't get rid of the C-section, just like we can't get rid of all the antibiotics. So we we need to design strategies to prevent these 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 diseases. What are these strategies? I mean. It's, Right, so from a C-section, C-section is a composite of things. It's, it's obviously the baby being born sterile without exposure to the birth canal, but it's also um, anesthesia, it's also antibiotics, it's also early labor in the case of uh, planned or, or scheduled C-sections. So we can, and lack of labor, of course, we cannot restore labor because it's a very complex process. We don't know how to induce labor and stop. We can not control that process. But one thing we can restore is microbes. So the first thought that I had a few years ago was if these babies are wrong, are born with the wrong set of microbes, why don't we give them the right set, set of microbes? And that's how we started we had to ask for IRB permit. It took a while, but eventually the IRB uh, committee understands that indeed what we are doing is not an intervention, but it's a restoration of, a, of an intervention, which is the C-section. So given the intervention, which is the need or you know, extracting the baby artificially, surgical birth, can we provide any exposure that was normal? And certainly vaginal fluids of the mother is one of those exposures. So we did the, the observational trial. We published a little pilot and then a bigger study showing 
that if a baby is born by C-section into the air and you let the baby, you know, their maturation of their microbiome spontane occurs spontaneously, that baby is very different to babies born vaginally. But if, that, yeah, if to that baby you give vaginal microbes, you partially normalize. You normalize very well in the skin, in the mouth, and partially normalize in the gut. So those babies look more like do babies born vaginally. And this is restoration. Um, so this is issue. Is it the maternal um, fecal or vaginal microbiome? I mean, there's studies on both of those. When you there do the restoration on, on human uh, individuals, um, is it the vaginal or is it the, 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 the fecal microbiome that you... Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, because so number one in nature, you will never find the birth canal that is not next to the excretion of feces canal. The nature design is not random. There is always either is the same canal like mm. in birds and in reptiles, or if there are two like in fish and in mammals, they are always next to each other. The urination canal could be far, mm. but the reproduction and the intestine are always together. So that's not random. And when, when you ask the question, well, when we do a vaginal swab, are we only sampling the vaginal or also the perineum, the area adjacent? Of course, probably the area adjacent. Mm. Uh, furthermore, there is a phenomenon that we observe using swabs that as mothers during pregnancy have very, very low diversity using in, in the vaginal swabs, but when they are giving birth during the perinatal window, they, we see higher diversity. And when we do source tracking, we find in the birth canal, oral bacteria, skin bacteria, much more than in women that are not pregnant. Mm. So we were shocked to see that because you could also call that vaginosis, a high diversity. But if you think it well, the birth canal is providing seeds of bacteria for every body side of the baby. Mm. It makes sense that nature allows colonization from other sites of the mother because the baby has a skin and has a mouth and has a nose and has a gut. So that's a, we reported that in a publication, that's a phenomenon that has not been well studied that, that I find fascinating. It's uh, almost like, I mean, I don't know if that's a speculation, but so normally any microbial ecosystem has this phenomenon uh, or this property colonization resistance, and I'm sure the vaginal microbiome has this as well. Could it be that that is um, lifted during the time of delivery so other microbes can? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the interpretation. And in the vagina, we know that pH is the major factor modulating composition. So the pH, and maybe that's what triggers labor. I mean, why, why are pregnant moms, animals or human, so susceptible to preterm and is associated with high diversity too early. Uh, it's associated with periodontitis. Mm. Period that means there is leaking in the gums epithelium that may be causing inflammation and inflammation leads to labor. But what triggers labor exactly? What's the mechanism? We don't know. But my suspicion is, is that it has to do with bacteria. Really interesting. Um, so is your impression that this this practice of um, you know seeding the infant with with vaginal micro, uh, microbiome of the mother is is that becoming widespread or is this just performed in uh, you know on demand of the patient or or so it, it has become widely spread. The term seeding, vaginal seeding was coined in Australia. I learned it. So it became viral when we published, I mean, in part because it's very logical, but 
I have to warn and I have, I received, especially at the beginning, a lot of emails. And I warn every mother, you know, you have to t tell your doctor because you could have an infection and you could be transmitting the infection. The fact is that for the studies, people do, you know, check. Um, in, indeed, the FDA called us and we have to repeat all the battery of um, vaginal health uh, tests the week before the C-section so that we are sure. But in any case, those babies are at higher risk than if they were born vaginally. There is no way because we look more carefully. We have pediatricians overlooking. We test more. So my message to the mothers is do not hide it from your doctor because your doctor can tell you if you have strep B or if you have a, you know, a chlamydia or if you have any you know, a, a symptomatic virus or mm -hmm. you need to know. In that case, you, know, you shouldn't do it. Although, again, a lot of those babies may have, if they were born vaginally, they would have been exposed. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so restoration of the normal process is, would be one indication for, um, <clears throat> for, for doing, you know, this, um, this seeding, but there's another question that, you know, we're living in this age of, as, as, as your film has, is, is, is showing, um, of, of this extinction process of, of microbial organisms and, um, which is transmitted and in, and enhanced from generation to generation. <clears throat> and once they're gone in the adult, there's not a good way of bringing them back in the adult. So it has been proposed also from, uh, you know, by you and, 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 and by your husband, this, this, this early restoration of ancient uh, microbial organisms will be, will, could become one solution. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, ethical and practical and clinical questions, you know, with uh, potential side effects. Um, but so there's really two two rationales why you would do the seeding. One is just to make sure uh, this normal maternal infant transmission happens, but then also to counteract this ongoing process of extinction. How, how close do you think, or how many years is that going to take before we have all the safety measures in place and and then from whom would this, whose, whose microbes would be transplanted? I mean, are they, would these be from the Yanomami or from the Hasta or, uh, or would these be cultured microbes? Where, where would these ancient microbes come from? Right, so that's a, again, a very good question. So when we have impaired transmission to the next generation, you can think, you know, C-section is a, a very big impact it's really impair, impairing a lot uh, and antibiotics which come with c-section but also antibiotics alone or you can have less impact for example the impact of a mother giving birth naturally without antibiotics but the mother is already depleted in her own diversity and the the neck the daughter will be even more depleted so we we observe a generational trend of losing diversity and because diversity is disappearing with urbanization, this is all linked to our lifestyle and our antimicrobial medicines and practices. We need to preserve that diversity. We don't know what functions are being lost. We, we still don't know that, but we can't wait until we know mm -hmm. to have the source of material to restore because it will have disappeared. Mm -hmm. So the number one step is we need to preserve the biodiversity of all microbiotas of the world, and not only humans, not only fecal, but also other sites of the human body, also animals, also soils, also marine environments, because we are messing the whole thing. It's, it's a major ecological catastrophe from our bodies to everywhere else. So preserving bacteria, luckily you can freeze bacteria and preserve them, preserve them alive. Um, we need to do that immediately. And that's an urgent call that 
we are doing through the Microbiota Vault, which is um, uh, an initiative that calls for preserving in local collections and then trying to build a very safe central vault to keep a backup of the local collections. Also do metagenomic sequencing so that the whole world knows what is there in terms of genes. And that would foster north-south collaboration between the rich countries that have the money and the technology but lost the diversity and the developing countries that don't have the money or the technology but are, are hotspots of biodiversity. So the answer is we suspect that every diversity from every place in the world matters and we need to preserve it to understand through research what are the functions what have we lost and you know the major challenge in medicine is going to be how do we re return reverse the trend of chronic diseases so as societies integrate in urban lifestyle they are trading they're not becoming net net healthier they are trading diseases they are trading infectious diseases for chronic diseases that are incurable mm -hmm. that are malfunctions of the immune system or metabolic dysfunctions this is the big challenge of medicine and to to answer this question and prevent and restore revert uh, we need to understand what is health, you know, and so we need to expand our view from medicine, expand it to ecology and to anthropology. We haven't, we are not there yet. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and, you know, thinking about this, this issue of um, these this chronic diseases, I mean, two things, I, I, I think the, the kind of the consequences, one is this <clears throat> continued increase in prevalence of chronic diseases. People don't really, don't seem to be particularly concerned about it because the mortality has gone down or is stable with massive uh, in, in, uh, investments of, and, you know, medications and surgeries and cardiac bypass surgeries. And so it's not being perceived like the pandemic, like the, the COVID-19 pandemic. But even the COVID-19, these pandemics are in some ways related to this, to this decreasing diversity because it makes us more vulnerable to all these viral diseases. And certainly, uh, you know, COVID-19 was not the last one that, that we are uh, experiencing. <clears throat> I right. find it amazing. Um, I mean, th thankfully, you know, COVID-19 has received tremendous worldwide attention. But this 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 epidemic of chronic non-transmittable diseases has not received the same attention. It's it's considered a given. Well, at a certain age, you're taking your blood pressure pills and your, uh, you know, diabetes pills, and uh, um, and life goes on. You know, it doesn't. Um... But economists have done projections, and and that's the reason. For example, um, we have a Nobel Prize winner uh, in our board in the microbiota vault. Jim Hegman, um, he works in projections of the cost for health systems in rich countries. And he estimates that there will be no country capable of maintaining health systems with uh, so many, such a big proportion of the population with chronic diseases. So right now we are just, it's the tip of the iceberg. And people say, okay, well, I am overweight, I have high blood pressure, and, or, you know, we are developing, you know, Alzheimer's, or our kids are autistic. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the cost of these uh, chronic diseases is going to be so enormous that societies will not be able to sustain and cover the medical costs. And that's why people like James Heckman, who is a Nobel Prize in economics from University of Chicago, uh, is in the board of the microbiota vault. He's done these projections and it simply is going to be unsustainable. Yeah, I'm, I'm always shocked. I mean, just to, um, particularly since, uh, you know, I mean, the whole microbiome research for me 
has changed my perspective from being a a gastroenterologist primarily and you know doing procedures and uh, focusing on 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 specific diseases of the GI tract to a much more holistic view you know it's and, and I think education is is a big part of this because I think both the um, well two things have happened the, the the lay public has now heard more about these uh, has has heard more bits and pieces about these stories and not necessarily transmitted by qualified people you know there's a lot of books out there that um, and and on social media and there's there's no real incentive for um, you know faculty at at university centers um, to get into this public education field which is time consuming you know so if you have to write NIH grants all the time it's not easy to find the time to do that but nevertheless I almost think there should be a a special path for clinical faculty to specialize on that, you know, just the, edu the public Absolutely. education. And, and that's why, you know, we invested a lot of time in the documentary because we think it's important to bring the message out there. But I also want to say that medical doctors who, who are really there when it's too late to cure diseases and manage diseases, and they, in their curriculum, there has to be, they have to understand ecology because they are treating an ecosystem. And they have to understand evolution because then they can better know, you know, how are we wired to be? Why, you know, why do we need C-sections? And, you know, and, and that's the only way we can push towards how do we better uh, manage our biological limitations, our mis, uh, misfits mm -hmm. with, because, we are now, you know, we sit on chairs. We never sat on chairs. Mm -hmm. We are losing the capacity to clutch as we all experience when we go to Japan. Mm -hmm. It's like you see the Westerners, we, we lost the flexibility and mm -hmm. that's not healthy. You know, we should, and that's what we do to our kids, et cetera, that causes back problems. So we need to understand what are the things we should be doing or if we perturb, restoring uh what are the postures we have evolved to to have and when we need medicine when we need to cheat nature because otherwise we are dead or our babies are dead then we cheat nature but then have to recover restore what we should respect and this is a is a, is a complex thing and at the very least Doctors should be should, should understand a little bit of ecological principles and anthropology, evol human evolution. Yeah, if I remember correctly, you have an anthropology background. I don't, but I so know part of my um, affiliation at Rutgers is in anthropology. So I became de facto, uh, you know, I, I'm moving the field of anthropology, but. Uh, I don't have a formal education in anthropology. I, I studied and read and uh, through my work and interacting with anthropologists. Uh, you know, the nature of the questions that I have asked is more anthropological than medical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like how to restore babies. What's the difference in urbanization levels? You know, as indigenous people move from the jungle to the towns, what happens to their microbiome um, and, and to their health. These are things that are very hard to find, to fund by NIH mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they are not answering questions that have to do with diseases. They are answering questions that have to do with biology, evolution, much more anthropology. Yeah, this brings me back to, I just I don't want to finish this without asking just a couple of questions about um, your experiences and your studies with the Yanomami. Um, <clears throat> this has clearly been, for me, like been a, a formative experience at the age of, I I don't remember how old I was in my in my mid-20s to spend that time on the Orinoco and and, and with, with the Yanomamis in one of their villages. Um, 
I realize from the films I've seen from today, a lot has changed since that time that we were there. And and I just recently read an article um, about the, the desperate medical situation of the the Yanomamis living in, in Brazil, particularly on the last president, um, now being dependent on being fed by, uh, you know, by, um, by the by the government and coming down with all kinds of diseases. My image of the Yanomami, from what I saw, was they are the healthiest people. They are, they live in a environment in the most natural environment, beautiful, abundant with animals, fish, and and you know mammals. Um, they, you know, take care of their children. The fathers take care of their children in a very admirable way. Um, and then came, you know, some of your studies showing that they also have the most diverse and 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 healthiest microbiome of of, of anybody in in the world. So how how have we gone, or how have they gone from that state thirty years ago to now being the sickest and and dying from, you know, all the Western diseases? What, what's the explanation for that? So the first, my first response is. Um... If you, if in the way, in the years you went there uh, and today in places that are still very remote and the miners haven't destroyed, if you pass the age of five, you are a survivor. So it's all very beautiful until you need a C-section and you don't have a C-section, then the baby dies or the mother dies. You fall from a tree and break your leg, mm -hmm. you are dead. Mm -hmm. So this really, when you find a, an adult, that person is such a survivor because they have survived without medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point. The second point is that everybody wants medicine and technology. So they, they all want to have doctors and when they can, they want to have to train their own people to be a nurse or a doctor. And that's perfectly human and understandable. Um, the reason why Although it's a challenge, how can they remain as they want? I've worked with Yanomami, Yequanas, Piaroas. There are 47 ethnic groups in Venezuela. And uh, the challenge is how can they remain in the territory where they want to be, where they feel they are guardians and they really respect nature? How can they remain there uh, having medicine and technology, communication. I think it's possible, but it requires an investment from the state, from the states, mm. um, from the governments. Um, so how can they live connected using technology and have medicine when they need it? They, they don't obviously, they want to save their loved ones just like we do, uh, but they want to remain there and keep their traditions. Um, what has happened is that uh, there is a historical abuse, disrespect, destruction of their environment because, you know, miners didn't care and still don't care. Um, there is a prejudice and racism uh, still today. And the non-indigenous people go there not because they want to kill the Indians or but because they want to exploit the resources mm -hmm. and when it's not legal then they do it illegally with in ways that are very very dirty and the destructive of the environment so minor illegal mining destroys their environment their, their rivers contaminates the rivers they cannot fish anymore they cannot eat from mm -hmm. They have no jungle anymore. So that is happening in both sides of the border of Venezuela and Brazil. Um, illegal miner is being uh, blind eye or tolerated mm -hmm. at the cost of the destruction of a resource that is not only valuable for them, but for us, for their culture is vital. So, you know, again, the challenge remains, how can they remain being the guardians, but without being isolated? That, and that's what they want. If you talk to them, they want medicine, 
but they they don't want doctors coming from abroad they want their own people to become mm. nurses and doctors mm -hmm. and be there connected they want to be able to go out and come back uh, you may think you know eventually they will change okay but it's their will they 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 have the right to determine what their destiny will be not us i mean fortunately you know there are forces and people and organizations that that try to help them with these goals um the, you know the main question is you know who's is, who's is stronger will this persist i mean I've, I've sort of been amazed you know some of the things that have come um like before it was always like this general story the the, the benefits we may get from all these um unknown plants and um things that grow in the in the rainforest for our own health for our medicines and and now we have a good example you know all these psychedelic compounds that all of a sudden you know some people think it's going to start a psychiatric a revolution in psychiatry that some of these compounds may be you know the most powerful and i'm sure it's these are not the only compounds you know there's a lot of other things that that these people know are guardians of that knowledge and so right um just destroying them and their wisdom is and it's not written down you know it's it's oral tradition um right. so and and again you know they have the right for example to determine how big their family uh, is instead of being subject to high mortality you know it's heartbreaking you know for us to go there and see you know what what it's like to be without medicine when you could prevent um, a lot of deaths. Uh, but the point is they need technology. You mm. see, to remain in the jungle, they need technology. Otherwise, mm. it's unsustainable. Mm. Their kids will go out. So there is also this pressure of some academics. Let them be. Let them do not bring medicine. I, I, I think that's not ethical. You mm. know, they want medicine like everybody wants medicine because you want to save your life or your the life of your loved ones mm -hmm. uh don't show them don't bring them to the cities well guess what they are curious as much as we are mm -hmm. i mean we are the same people mm -hmm. we, we shouldn't patronize them mm -hmm. uh, they have the right to see the ocean and as we have the the right to go and see the the jungle so how can we work with them to show them what we have done well and we have what we have done bad to show them what it's like if they integrate and move to the cities what because they see that their skills which are vital in the jungle are not paid at all in the urban settings nobody pays for the skills they have mm -hmm. so they become the poorest of the poorest when they move to towns and cities and that is heart heartbreaking. They, their life quality certainly goes down dramatically, and they are they are inserted in the terrible uh, circle of poverty and misery. So again, it it takes to be transparent with them and and have a horizontal conversation, not patronizing, to determine you know what they want what discuss with them show them what we have done bad because mm -hmm. not everything in our culture is good and how do they want to integrate and become technological villages remaining in the amazon mm -hmm. yeah so you know we could go on with this conversation uh, i think for the sake of time i think we'll cut it off here so clearly major challenges both in uh, you know counteracting the ongoing extinction of um, not just of species of, of animals, but also of our microbial partners in life. And, um, but also, you know, preserving and preventing the extinction of, of this uh, indigenous wisdom and these populations that have probably have so much to say that we don't even know yet. Um, so thanks again, uh, Gloria, for taking this time. I, I want to, Come back to drawing the attention of the listeners to the documentary film um, that deals with several of the topics, including this vault um, that 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 we talked about. Um, the invisible extinction. 
the invisible extinction. I think the, the directors made a excellent film. I mean, we just we are just there, you know, answering questions and letting them into our houses, etc. I think it's a very human pro portrait of scientists and patients uh, with that message um, of the need to to be more ecological and to preserve the biodiversity. We still don't know why we need. Um, but I want to thank you, Emeran, for this uh, initiative and for educating so many people. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Thanks, Gloria. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Emeran.